you're in the water loop. <laughs> Hi, this is Travis with Waterloop. Water conservation is very important to me. I bet it is to many of you as well. That's why I have high Sierra shower heads in my house, and I'm really happy that they're a supporter of this podcast. They carry the EPA WaterSense label for efficiency, and they use 40% less water than conventional low flow shower heads. The model I use runs at only a gallon and a half per minute. And because of their unique nozzle design, patented that nobody else has, it maximizes efficiency of water and energy, but doesn't compromise on performance. You still get a very strong shower. Use promo code WATERLOOP for 20% off at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. For this episode, I am very happy to be joined by Judith Ank. She is founder of Beyond Plastics and a senior fellow and visiting faculty member at Bennington College. She was also the former administrator for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Region 2, which is where I professionally overlapped with her when I was in the headquarters office in D.C. for six years. Judith, I'm so glad to connect for the podcast. Yeah, delighted to be with you. What a fun podcast! Yeah, hope let's let's have fun with this here. Um, let, let's dive into plastics, uh, and you've really worked your whole life on plastics and plastic pollution. Why? Yeah, I'm kind of a solid waste gal, and I think it's because I am concerned about the massive overconsumption of natural resources mostly by Americans, if you look at the percentage of our population and then the amount of natural resources we consume, the amount of energy we use, the amount of waste we generate. And then on top of that, when it comes time for disposal, if you don't reuse, recycle, or compost, that means that waste goes to garbage incinerators or landfills. And those waste facilities are almost always cited in low-income communities of color. So I was working on those environmental justice issues before it was even called environmental justice. When I lived in the city of Albany, New York, there was a really bad polluting garbage incinerator in a low-income African-American community owned and operated by the state of New York, of all things. And it took us years of organizing to get that shut down. So I'm always thinking of communities that are on the receiving end of um, pollution from landfills and incinerators, and I really want to drive down the generation of waste. And I'm focused on plastics because it has an anemic recycling rate of only 8%, and so much plastic gets into the ocean. And I'm heartbroken that we are turning our oceans into unpermitted landfills. It's having an enormous impact on marine life and also on people. So this issue uh, addresses so much that I care the most about, oceans, fish and wildlife, environmental justice, uh, human health, because it's not good to be consuming plastic. You and I, Travis, breathe in about a credit card worth of plastic every week in microplastics. Mm. Um, And it is in every corner of the globe. It's in Arctic ice, it's in drinking water, it's in shellfish, it's in agricultural soils. And if you walked into your bathroom and your bathtub was overflowing, what would you do? You wouldn't take a little spoon and start bailing out the tub. You would turn off the tap. And that's what we need to do with plastics. We have to produce less. We can't recycle our way out of this problem. We have to make less plastic. And now it's an urgent climate change issue because plastics are made from ethane, a byproduct of hydrofracking. And as demand for fossil fuels is dramatically reduced, for electricity and transportation, because we have more renewable energy and we have more cleaner transportation choices, Uh, plastics have become plan B 
for the fossil fuel industry to keep them relevant and profitable. So for those little reasons, <laughs> I've decided to rearrange my life and um, founded an organization called Beyond Plastics. And I also teach classes on plastic pollution at Bennington College in Vermont, which is not far from where I live. I think this is the very first, a few semesters ago, I, I started teaching and I think it was the first college level plastics policy course anywhere. And it's been really enriching and fun to go on this policy journey with college students who have different ideas and more optimistic insights on how we get out of this mess. Yeah, fantastic. I, I want to dive into Beyond Plastics and, and what that that uh, your organization does, but I want to to chat about some of the things you mentioned because I, I share the heartbreak with you at just how polluted we have made the planet and the ocean. It's unbelievable when you look at the statistics of how much plastic is out there and how it has permeated, you know, every creature and every part of the environment. You mentioned where it's found. I think like at the in the deepest parts of the ocean, they've they've found the plastic as well. I never heard the thing about breathing in a credit card worth of of kind of microplastic floating in the air before. Um, that is stunning and terrifying. Um, you know, I, I'm not a huge seafood person, but I also have started shying away from it more just because I, f I think it kind of bio, bioaccumulates in, in seafood and fish. Um, and that's, that's frightening. Um, and I also think that stat you shared about recycling needs to be highlighted more for people. They figure, hey, I don't want plastic just going anywhere. I'm going to recycle it. I'm going to recycle every bit of plastic in my house. But that plastic that goes in your recycling bin, it, it's not all getting taken care of. Um, and th so there's issues there, you know? Um, yeah, and, and it's not our fault as consumers. We've been duped by the petrochemical industry. They've spent millions on advertising saying, if you've got a plastic material, just toss it in your recycling bin. But they know that most plastics are not recyclable. And yet, you, if you notice, they try to shift the responsibility to the consumer. We shouldn't be litter bugs. Um, we need to be responsible consumers. Well, I'm pretty careful trying to avoid purchasing plastic in my own consumer choices, and I can't avoid it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need big brands like Coke and Pepsi and Burger King and uh, Apple and Starbucks to make a commitment to reduce their plastic footprint. I think the public really wants that. People are feeling kind of helpless and guilty. And those are not two feelings that really inspire change. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you and I used to work at a federal agency. It's kind of like when you go to see a surgeon, she or he will tell you you need surgery. When you come to me to talk about a problem, I say we need new laws and strong enforcement of the laws because we need systemic change. Individual action is nice, but it's not going to stem the tide of 9 million pounds, I'm sorry, 9 million tons, 9 million tons of plastic entering the ocean every year. And most of it is not on the surface. There was just a report that trying to remove Plastics, once it's out in the ocean, is completely ineffective because the vast majority of the ocean falls down to the bottom of the seafloor. And it also, you know, will get ground up into little pieces of microplastics. So if you throw uh, a plastic water bottle, a single-use water bottle, in, on, as a form of litter, it eventually gets into the ocean. It's exposed to sunlight, it gets brittle, wave action, acts almost like a paper shredder. And that one plastic water bottle, which by the way, you don't have to use if you have a very innovative invention here. <laughs> yes, a glass, right? I, I, uh, I've, I've got mine as well. <clears throat> and some podcasts and videos I see, I see people with plastic bottles. And, and one of the ones that bothers me the most is when I see press conferences for professional sports teams billion dollar franchises and they're sitting there with a plastic water bottle, right? I'm like, what are you doing? Be leaders on this stuff. Yeah, yeah those <laughs> little things with people in the media really, really help. And so, because if you're not 
you know, and most Americans are fortunate to have clean tap water. There are more microplastics in bottled water than in tap water, for instance. So if you can avoid that single-use plastic water bottle, um, you are helping to clean the ocean because when it gets into the ocean, it becomes microplastics. Yeah. One of the other things I'd, I'd people might be like, why are you obsessed about plastics? There's all these other types of pollution, all these other resources we're consuming and things that are in consumer products. But, you know, plastics just stay around forever. I, you know, that's one of the big, big problems here. Like paper will decompose, but plastic is around for hundreds of years. Yes. It's like, I think I heard every plastic that's ever been manufactured still exists. Right. right? Unless it's incinerated, which then creates air pollution. But you're right. It's, it, it sticks around for centuries. It's everywhere. And why I'm optimistic on this issue is I have not met a plastic pollution denier the way I have met a climate change denier. I mean, everyone knows it's a problem. You just have to walk down your street look up in a tree in a city, you see plastic bags. The disagreement comes on how do we solve this gargantuan problem, but at least we have consensus that it's a problem. Even the petrochemical industry acknowledges this, but unfortunately their solution is to burn most of it and just keep producing massive gargantuan amounts of plastic, which you know, has enormous climate change implications and air toxics and implications. What we do at Beyond Plastics is we focus on every step, production, use, and disposal. Because uh, you really need to look at all three steps to fully understand the enormity of the public health and environmental crisis that plastic is creating. Mm. Um, you mentioned something a couple of times. Uh, still, we're going to dive into the details on Beyond Plastics, but I also uh, you mentioned how the fossil fuel industry is now ratcheting up plastic production as demand for fossil fuels has gone down. And I was talking to Chad Nelson, the CEO of Surfrider Foundation, recently, and he clued me into that and talking about these facilities in the Midwest and there's a big one maybe in Ohio or West Virginia or something where they're 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 just mm -hmm. making these cheap plastics as a way to get rid of their products. I don't know if you can add any more credible yeah. <laughs> information to that. Yeah, hardly anyone knows about this. Um, these, what basically what happens is if you are at a fracking well pad, most of the ethane, which is a byproduct of fracking, just gets vented into the atmosphere, which is a terrible thing. And EPA actually had regulations to address that, which the Trump administration is trying to roll back and hopefully they will lose in court on. Um, so what the petrochemical industry has decided to do is to capture some of that methane through pipelines and send it to brand new ethane cracker facilities. It's a funny name. Mm. Basically what they do is they heat the ethane at very high temperature and they crack it. And then it becomes the main ingredient, the building block of single use plastic packaging which is then shipped uh, to facilities in Louisiana, the Formosa proposal, and also around the world. And it's not because of consumer demand, it's because of excess capacity. The frackers have too much um, byproduct and too much uh, fracked gas that they're looking for new uses uh, because it's not as needed for electricity generation and transportation. Sure. All right. Beyond Plastics, which you founded, um, talk a little bit more about what you do. I'm, I'm interested in kind of the area of advocacy, legislation, research, public engagement, maybe kind of on the advocacy front. What's your approach? Well, the nice thing about Beyond Plastics is we're small and, and flexible, um, and I'm free range. I like to kind of go where the action is. And so we have lots of new followers. Um, people can just go to beyondplastics.org and for free sign up to get our information. We weigh in where we feel like there's value add. Um, I'm not a slick Washington lobbyist, but I definitely am supporting uh, the Break Free from Plastic 
Pollution Act in, in Washington. We provide resources to community leaders who want to work on local policies. We developed um, a model bill called the Plastic Trifecta, which advocates in Vermont just passed statewide. It just took effect July 1. It bans polystyrene foam for food purposes, bans plastic bag, fee on paper bag, plastic straws only upon request. That will really drive down demand for single-use plastics. Um, we provide technical assistance to people who are trying to figure out how to work on this issue locally. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking to reporters who, you know, quite honestly, I think one reason why the plastics issue is taking off, even during COVID, is because the media decided a few years ago to focus on the facts in a big way. So basically, we just push out facts and we don't do our own research. We push out other research that we think is accurate and credible. We work with college students. Um, my, I'm, for the first time, I'm teaching my plastic pollution class online and anyone around the country can take it uh, starting September 17th. Uh, it's six consecutive Thursday nights, so I'll have a mix of students and community people. Registration is still open for that. Um, and pre-COVID, I did a lot of public speaking, and so now I'm public speaking on Zoom. <laughs> I haven't mastered. Yeah. But we're, we're just an information machine. That's awesome. Hey, listen, I'm, I, I believe in being an information machine. That's what I'm trying to do with this podcast is, is just amplify and, and be a microphone for others. So that's a critical role out there. Um, you know, you've mentioned students a couple times. You have students that are, you know, 18 to 22, uh, Generation Z, right? Um, what's, what's their mindset? Are they are really fired up about this issue? Are they clued in? Are they pretty savvy? How do you find them? Yeah, I mean, they keep me optimistic. Um, they get their news from different sources. You'll be happy to know when I ask them every semester, I ask my new flock of students, where do you get your news from? Most of them say podcasts. All right. <laughs> and, and I still um, require them to write a letter to the editor to local newspapers, which they're typically not familiar with. Wow. Um, so it's, it's a different world on communications. They're great researchers. Uh, they're very curious and they want to change the world. You know, um, COVID has, has hit everyone hard. And last semester we, we closed quickly, like every other college Not we didn't close, but we shifted to sent everyone home, shifted to, um, online learning and they didn't miss a beat. You know, they're like, yeah, COVID is really terrible, but we can manage one more than one crisis at a time. They're deeply interested in climate change. And the real gift for me has been to have international students in the class. I learned so much from my students from Nepal, India, Mexico, um, Bosnia, um, just um, Finland. Uh, just all over the world and having that international perspective is really valuable because this really is an international issue that we need to um, work together to solve. Sure. One of the things I saw on your webpage is about uh, some good films about plastic. Uh, you know, if people want to learn more, get educated, spread the word. Uh, do you have a couple suggestions for, for films to yes. check out? Yeah, we did a virtual film festival right when COVID hit. And the three I would highly recommend are, one, The Story of Plastic, uh, which is put out by the feisty nonprofit called The Story of Stuff. You can go to, it's on the Discovery Channel app, or you can just go to thestoryofplastic.org. I recommend that people watch it and then consider hosting a virtual showing of the film, which the organization encourages. Second is Microplastic Madness, oh boy. which is really <sighs> uplifting. It features um, elementary school students in Red Hook, Brooklyn, who are tackling microplastics. And it's put out by this really talented little nonprofit in New York City called Cafeteria Culture. So go to the cafeteriaculture.org website. And I find myself, when, 
on the rare day that I'm feeling a little blue about not making progress on plastic, I just watch the trailer for Microplastic Madness. It makes me so happy. And then the third one I would recommend is called Plastic Wars, and that's easy to get. It's a frontline episode. So just go to pbs.org and you can click for free one hour. It's similar to the story of plastic um, in terms of the information, but it's different enough that you should watch both. I thought I knew a lot about plastics, but once I, I watched the story of plastics, which I've seen many times now and I show my, my class it, um, I learned something new every time. And I have to say the first few times I watched it, I felt physically ill mm. in terms of what we are doing to people and our planet. Um, so um, all three are amazing, uh, but be ready for, so watch it in order. Do the story of plastic first and then do microplastic <laughs> madness. It'll lift you up. <laughs> yeah, get you back up there. That's uh, Those recommendations are awesome. I haven't seen any of those three, so I will check them out myself. You would, you yeah. would really love them. And you, maybe you should have the the makers of the movies on your podcast. I love that idea. Very yeah. cool. Thank you. Um, before we move on from plastics to some fun other topics, uh, coronavirus, you've mentioned a couple times. How has this whole coronavirus pandemic and the way society has responded, our economies responded, how has that impacted single-use plastics? Well, it's um, on one hand, it's on the increase because people are nervous about reusable products. On the other hand, because people have not been at work unless you're an essential worker, you know, huge buildings all over cities are, don't have workers in them for the last six months or so. So that's actually cut down on a lot of single use plastic use. People are eating at home more. Um, so overall, commercial generation of trash is down, residential is up a bit. Although, even though you're at home, you know, you're using real dishes and real <laughs> utensils and real plates. Um, I think the biggest problem has been the plastics industry out of the gate trying to exploit the crisis and trying to get people to believe that like reusable grocery bags are a source of the coronavirus, which is not true. And we were lucky that in March, there was some really solid data out of um, the New England Journal of Medicine that told us how long the virus lasted on different surfaces. It actually lasts the longest on plastic surfaces as compared to cardboard. Um, so the big problem is, you know, I remember in January, uh, the plastics lobbyists we're trying to delay New York State's plastic bag ban in January, mm -hmm. saying that because of the virus in China, there will be a shortage of paper bags, and therefore New York should delay its implementation of the plastic bag law, um, which they didn't convince anyone of, but then the plastic bag industry sued, and so we're still tied up in court. But um, reusables are okay as long as you wash them with soap and water. It's just like we wash our clothes. You know, sure. you, wash, you should wash your reusable grocery bags. You should wash your, um, your coffee mug with soap and water if you're getting coffee to go. Um, so the, the real problem has been perception more than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, I mentioned at the beginning that you were the administrator for EPA's Region 2, uh, for, and I want to talk about some of the things you dealt with there or some of the perspective you bring from that time to some, to some issues. Um, PFAS. I, I was at the Office of Water in, in EPA headquarters, uh, kind of when Hoosick Falls emerged as a, a, a national headline, a national storyline. And I think that was one of the things that really kicked off the nationwide global attention on PFAS was, was Hoosick Falls, New York. Could you kind of just quickly summarize what happened there? And I think you've continued to be involved in trying to be an advocate. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, tell if you could tell that story, I'd appreciate it. Sure. So I'm sitting at my desk one day at EPA and a local government official calls me and asks if I have $3 million hanging around <laughs> to give the village of Hoosick Falls 
to install carbon filtration on their drinking water supply. And I said, no, you know, we give all our clean water money to the states. Um, I'll, I'll look around, but I know I don't have an extra $3 million. What's going on in Hoosick Falls? I've never heard of this. What's happening? Why do they need to carbon fil in install carbon filtration on their public water supply serving thousands of people? And I was told that there were high levels of PFOA in drinking water. I said, you're kidding. I mean, I, I happen to be from the county where Hoosick Falls is. It's about 45, not 40 minutes from my home. Um, I said, I've never heard of this. Um, oh yes, we, this is a big problem. You know, there's a company called St. Gobain and they're very close to the wells of the public water supply. And so I said, well, how, how long has, has the state of New York and the county known about this? 18 months. And I said, wait a minute, the levels you just told me far exceed the EPA drinking water advisory. Um, they were well over 400 parts per trillion in most of the samples. What do you mean you've known about this for, for 18 months? So that call didn't go well. And then I immediately called the New York State Health Department because they had responsibility um, to implement the Safe Drinking Water Act. And they confirmed that that indeed was the case. Um, I'm sorry, I told that story a little long, wrong. It was the state health department who told me 18 months. Gotcha, was, uh, oh wow. It was the county executive who told me it was a problem, she was looking for money. It was the state health department told me 18 months, and don't do anything, Judith, because we're in negotiations with the company to try to get them to offer free bottled water at the local supermarket. Huh. And it was the company who said, now you should all go out and try to get tax dollars to install arbitration. <sighs> really bad strategic move on their part. Um, and I'll explain why. So my first thing was you have to tell the public to stop drinking the water. It's not safe. You know, things come at us at EPA and sometimes it's shades of gray. Sometimes it's a close call. I always erred on the side of protecting public health and this one was not even close. So I strongly urged the state health department to tell people to stop drinking the water. They wouldn't do that. I reached out many, many times also to the governor's office and said, you gotta tell people to stop drinking the water and then we'll regroup, we'll figure out how EPA can help on a cleanup. And they never would tell the public, so I did. And I issued an EPA news release. It was run by your office as well. I wasn't going rogue. And urged the residents to stop drinking the water. After that, things really started clicking and happening. Uh, the company, the uh, St. Cobain, did make free bottled water available in the supermarket. But I think what they didn't understand is, yes, we needed to deal with the immediate issue of getting clean water to people, but we also needed the legacy of contamination to be cleaned up. And so that site has now become a state Superfund site, a federal Superfund site, it's going to cost the company probably hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up. And it was, it all got kicked off because they wouldn't come up with the two or $3 million to install the carbon filtration. Mm. The really sad thing is many people have had their health compromised. Um, the state health department uh, eventually did widespread blood sampling and biomonitoring and found high levels of PFOA in many of the residents' blood. Um, there are health problems in the community and the Superfund process is super slow. Uh, St. Cobain is dragging their heels trying not to pay for the cleanup. And I think you're right, Travis, I think this put the PFAS issue on the map na nationally, but we're five years in here and um, the people of this little beautiful little upstate New York community um, have not been made whole. And uh, we still have a lot of work to do there. 
I should also add that I think the uh, the situation in West Virginia, where Rob Balot, uh, you know, unearthed the the. PFAS pollution that really harmed so many members in that community there uh, was a was a big part of raising this issue. I think kind of these things kind of rose up around the same time, I guess. But I do I do want to mention uh, mention that scenario. It's another movie to watch, Dark Waters, which Ab- is a true story. Highly recommend that. Yeah, movie. yeah, uh, and you know the other thing is it's not just those eighteen months that they knew about it. People were exposed to that that chemical in their water for a long time. And that's what leads to the health issues. So I live in, uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, I moved here the same month that it came out that Kimors, a DuPont subsidiary, had been putting Gen X, a PFAS you mm-hmm. know, chemical, in the Cape Fear River for nearly four decades uh, mm-hmm. and had been in the water here. And so the local utility is paying $43 million to put in uh, granular activated carbon filtration. All of us that are customers are paying for that on our, on our monthly bill for a couple years. Of course, they are going after Comores, but right now it's falling on the ratepayers and that utility to fund a technology to get that that PFAS out of the water. Um, so, uh, so sorry you're going through that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I feel lucky because I'm super informed, new. right? And I and I'm new. I'm new, yeah, and so and I'm informed. And I have the means to put uh, a point of use filter under my sink where a lot of people don't, you know. Um, Well, you know, in New York, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation went out to every home that had a private well and put uh, the point of use filters on all of those homes. And then they're sending the bill to the polluters. hmm. I mean, I think your state could be much more aggressive. Hmm. Um, there's no reason why ratepayers have to front this cost. Yeah, I uh, just before this call, I got an email from my utility saying that there was an amendment to the consent decree or whatever, and the utility wasn't even privy to the negotiations. The state and Comores just worked this out <gasps> themselves, and I'm like, wow. so so they the utility has called that out, you know, said, hey, <laughs> we we weren't even involved in this. This is crazy. So. Yeah. I get, uh, yeah, I, my blood starts boiling with all of this corporate polluting and them refusing to make things right and, and pay when they've profited so much. Um, so uh, another couple topics I want to talk about. Um, one that gets my blood boiling a lot is seeing what the Trump administration has done at EPA and especially with water policies, uh, just damaging and, and disturbing changes. Um, I think we could easily have a whole 30 minute or longer conversation on those, but I was wondering if there's a couple things you might want to point out um, that you, you view as problematic for, for water policy in the U.S., Well, it's now about 100 federal environmental regulations that have either been rolled back or delayed. Um, Now, the good news is that state attorneys general and national environmental groups like Natural Resources Defense Council, Earth Justice, Center for Biological Diversity, all groups that we should be supporting, um, they're winning in court. They're winning most of the cases. And so just... If there is a new administration in January, a lot of those regs, uh, those those gutting of the regulations can be reversed. I think it's going to take a long time because you have to go through the legal due process process. But I think, um, you know, we can put the brakes on some of the worst parts of this, but we've lost valuable time. I actually think you won't, you probably wouldn't think of this for water, but I think a rollback that is going to have profoundly negative impacts on water is repealing the clean power plan because carbon emissions contribute to climate change and climate change is giving us violent weather, sea level rise, uh, drinking water challenges, you know, um, all, all over the, the world. And, um, you know, it, it, air pollution affects water. Certainly, uh, the repeal of the waters of the United States rule was absolutely a mistake. Um, th- this is dealing with wetlands protection, uh, which also protects groundwater and surface water. 
Um, some of the rollbacks in the pesticides arena is a mistake because a lot of pesticides contaminate groundwater and surface water. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. The, the, one, the one reg that they uh, reversed themselves on was very early in the administration. You probably remember this regulation that dealt with mercury in uh, dental fillings. Mm -hmm. um, many states had already required dental offices to have capture devices so you're not spitting mercury down the, um, down the sink at your dentist office. And I know the Office of Water worked really hard at the end to get this over the finish line. And the Trump administration, and remember that guy, Scott Pruitt, um, <laughs> EPA administrator, they just blindly went to repeal everything. And on that one, the dental society said, wait, 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 we like this. <laughs> Don't repeal it. And I think it was the only regulation that they backtracked on and allowed to take effect. Um, you know, and then the other thing is just the uh, attack on science at EPA, and it's led to hundreds, if not thousands, of really talented career staff to leave. So it's going to take a while to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, you've got you, you've got the to do list. You've got all the regs that have been gutted, so you have to get them back. And I would recommend that you not put them back exactly as is. You have to hit the refresh button, see if there's an opportunity to make them more effective. And you know, one thing I always believed and said when I was at EPA Region 2 is, we want strong regulations, but we also need them to be clear, particularly for small businesses. A small business shouldn't have to hire their own engineering firm to understand what their legal responsibilities are. So. I know that's something that the Trump administration actually could have done that was helpful, but instead they came in with a sledgehammer. They, they should have come in with a more surgical approach at efficiency yeah. um, and making it easier for companies to comply. That doesn't mean you relax the standards. It means you provide some clarity. So, you know, a small business doesn't have to hire a lawyer and an engineer on their dime. But um, if there is a second Trump administration, I honestly don't know what we're going to do. Um, I think the drinking water, surface water uh, resources are, are going to really suffer. Yeah. Uh, one of the regulations that um, also upset me to see go backward is, um, you know, the Office of Water put out uh, rules for power plants and the discharge of a lot of heavy metals and other toxins into waterways. Um, these, you know, plants, power plants that are kind of on the eastern you know, this side of the Mississippi and are responsible for huge amounts of these, these toxins, heavy metals, really bad, bad stuff for public health um, in, in waterways. Like, it's just horrific to see that kind of thing be like, nope, go ahead, keep doing that. Um, so, well, the good news is something like that would not will not be that complicated to reinstate. Mm -hmm. So people have to vote in November, and they need to vote early. Yeah. I actually just um, completed my request for an absentee ballot today in August. Mm. Wow. I don't take any chances i tell you i am i am my plan is to mask up and go and cast my vote because of all this nonsense that's going on which has nothing to do with water but anyway um Last thing I wanted to kind of talk to you about, which you also dealt with there in EPA Region 2, was, um, you know, the hurricanes. And um, I think Sandy hit New York when you were there. Uh, and then you had some, some – have had some big storms that have come through Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. They're very – obviously very susceptible to these – storms which are growing stronger and more frequent with climate change i just had uh category one hurricane isaias uh roll through my town here in wilmington but um i'm wondering about your thoughts on what hurricane resilience and recovery should look like especially for you know puerto rico u.s virgin islands caribbean well you're right um i was the EPA when Sandy hit, and it was just horrific. You know, hundreds of lives lost, major environmental damage. And there you had fairly sophisticated governments trying to respond, and it was, it was very, very difficult. It was right after I left EPA that um, Maria hit, 
And I remember um, the governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands called me and asked, could I come down and help out? Um, and I instantly said yes. And then I said, for how long? <laughs> he said three months. And I said, wow. I, can't, I can't do three months, but I'll come for three weeks. So I got one of the first commercial flights into the U.S. Virgin Islands. And the, the damage was just unbelievable. It was devastating to these islands. I stayed with a friend in St. John because there were no hotels to stay anywhere. Mm. But most of my work was on St. Thomas, and then I would take the ferry <clears throat> over to St. John. Um, I think there are hundreds of things that need to happen for resiliency. Um, the first is pulling some of the development back from the waterfront. Uh, buildings that get knocked down over and over again should not be rebuilt. Um, secondly, uh, just based on my experience in the Caribbean, the, the uh, power lines need to be buried. Uh, the poles were just breaking like match sticks. Um, at the sewage treatment plants, all of the equipment needs to be taken out of the basement and elevated to higher levels. Um, and there's also just basic um, human service planning that needs to happen. How do you make sure that people who are taking medication that needs to be refrigerated, how do they keep that refrigerated when, when power is out for months at a time? So a community response system where we look out for our neighbors and our elders that's not hard to organize. That needs to be happening now. So my mind, of course, goes to the infrastructure piece. There's also the human capital piece, um, which worked fairly well um, from my observation in the U.S. Virgin Islands, really, truly caring, wonderful people, but it certainly could have been a, a lot better organized. And then you have to figure out waste disposal. Unfortunately, with both Sandy and... Um, Maria, the Army Corps of Engineers, wanted to burn all of the wood uh, in, in these um, like mobile incinerators, which I was strongly against. Like people are dealing with mold and asthma, and then you're gonna increase their <clears throat> air pollution. So um, it's much better to chip and use that wood for composting purposes. So it was such a battle in the US Virgin Islands um, that the legislature there passed a bill prohibiting hurricane wood from being burned. The governor vetoed it, and then the legislature overrode the veto. So in the US Virgin Islands, that debate doesn't have to happen again. But it's, I think, very irresponsible for the Army Corps of Engineers, a federal agency, to be pushing polluting cleanup strategies like that. So. You know, I know lots of money has gone into resiliency planning, but until you've lived through a couple of those storms, um, you see that a lot of those plans just kind of sit on the shelf. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, uh, you know, these storms are going to get worse. And so, and we've lost the last four years pretty much, three and a half years. So we have to get back to building resilient communities. Yeah, and I know one of the challenges with that is the, the money required to to rebuild this infrastructure when the damage is so extensive. Um, a lot of money does go to recovery, uh, and I know lots of groups and, and people call for it to be rebuilt with that resilient mindset. So um, it's going to yeah. definitely be necessary. Uh, <laughs> the climate is not going anywhere. It's just getting worse, and those hurricanes are going to keep coming. Um, yeah. A lot of great recommendations, though. Good, good common sense steps uh, to be taken. Uh, Judith, it was awesome to connect with you. Uh, Great to see you. Yeah. Wonder wonderful to, to talk about these topics. Um, www.beyondplastics.org. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, we love hearing from people. Yeah. Thank you so much. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. The Waterloop Podcast is brought to you by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart and stylish way to save water, energy, and money while enjoying a powerful shower. Use promo code WATERLOOP for 20% off at HighSierraShowerheads.com. You're in the Waterloop. Waterloop.